Hello, my name is Dr. Kimberly Cheatham. Welcome to a discussion on abnormal uterine bleeding. The objectives for this presentation on abnormal bleeding are listed here. Abnormal uterine bleeding is contrasted with normal bleeding patterns. The parameters of normal uterine bleeding are listed here. Common words associated with abnormal uterine bleeding and their definitions include oligomenorrhea, polymenorrhea, menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, and menometrorrhagia. Diagnosing a patient who presents with a complaint of abnormal bleeding relies on a thorough history, a focused physical examination, and the understanding that a patient's age will have an influence on the most likely etiologies for abnormal bleeding. This slide includes a differential diagnosis for abnormal bleeding. One of the most common etiologies is ovulatory dysfunction, also referred to as anovulation or dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We will talk about this more in depth. DUB, or dysfunctional uterine bleeding, is the term used for any abnormal uterine bleeding that is not associated with a structural defect or a medical condition. DUB indicates the presence of anovulation. The characteristics of DUB can range widely from infrequent light periods to constant heavy bleeding. DUB is a diagnosis of exclusion. To make the diagnosis, other etiologies must be ruled out. If a patient is anovulatory, this means that no egg is released from the ovary mid-cycle. Consequently, no corpus luteum is formed and progesterone is not produced. In most of these patients, estrogen is still being produced by the ovary and the uterine lining continues to thicken in response. The uterine lining becomes thicker and thicker until it outgrows the blood supply and begins to slough, leading to irregular spotting or heavy bleeding. You can see a thickened endometrial stripe on pelvic ultrasound in these patients. Another type of anovulation that is less common than what was described on the previous slide occurs from suppression of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus normally produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, which acts on the pituitary to stimulate release of the gonadotropins FSH and LH. If the hypothalamus is suppressed, which can occur with extreme stress, eating disorders, weight loss, or a brain tumor, GnRH is not produced. This means that there is no GnRH to stimulate the pituitary to make gonadotropins. If gonadotropin levels are low in the bloodstream, the ovary is not stimulated to make estrogen or to ovulate, so both estrogen and progesterone are low. This is different from the more common type of anovulation where progesterone is low, but estrogen levels are normal or high. Low levels of estrogen can lead to irregular bleeding because the uterine lining becomes very thin and fragile. Pelvic ultrasound shows a thin endometrial stripe in these patients. Anovulation is most commonly seen in the one to two years after menarche when the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis is immature and the girl has not yet begun to ovulate. It is also commonly seen in perimenopausal women who have few functional ovarian follicles left, so ovulation does not occur or is irregular. Health risks of anovulatory uterine bleeding are related to the amount of blood loss and to the unopposed estrogen exposure. The constant estrogen signal to the endometrium without any progesterone increases a woman's risk of developing uterine cancer. Other adverse patient effects can include anemia and iron deficiency if bleeding is heavy, infertility because an egg is not being released, reduced quality of life from heavy or unpredictable bleeding, and increased healthcare costs. Here is a list of possible etiologies for anovulatory uterine bleeding, or DUB. How do we evaluate patients who present with an unknown cause of abnormal bleeding? Always begin with a detailed history, including a menstrual history. Important questions to ask are listed on this slide. Here are more important topics to cover during the patient history. The answers to these questions can provide clues to the etiology of abnormal bleeding. The next step in the evaluation of a patient with abnormal uterine bleeding is a physical examination. 
care should be given to note findings listed on this slide, which can point to a diagnosis. Laboratory testing is usually indicated in patients with abnormal uterine bleeding. The very first test should be a pregnancy test, because this is a common cause of abnormal bleeding that you do not want to miss. Other labs should include a TSH to rule out thyroid disease and a prolactin level to rule out hyperprolactinemia. If the patient is bleeding heavily, check a CBC with platelets. A pap smear is indicated if the patient is at least 21 years old and has not had a recent normal pap. STD testing is indicated for high-risk patients, including all women younger than 25 years of age. This slide lists laboratory tests and tissue sampling that might be indicated depending on the patient's age and history. Another helpful piece of information comes from a pelvic ultrasound. Ultrasound imaging is not indicated in the initial workup of a young, straightforward patient. However, if a patient is over 30 years old or has an abnormal uterine examination, pelvic ultrasound should be ordered because the presence of a structural abnormality, such as a uterine fibroid or polyp, is more likely to be found. Once an etiology for the patient's abnormal uterine bleeding is identified, treatment can be considered. The appropriate choice of therapy will depend on several factors, including the etiology of bleeding and its severity, the patient's medical history, her desire for fertility, and her desire for medical versus surgical management. If a structural lesion such as a polyp or a fibroid is the cause of the bleeding, correction of the anatomic pathology should be curative. If a medical condition such as thyroid disease is present, this should also be corrected. If anovulation is present and other etiologies have been ruled out, medical management should be the first step in treatment. This can include treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, progestin therapy, or estrogen plus progestin therapy. NSAIDs are helpful because they inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, a factor in heavy bleeding. Synthetic progesterone, known as progestins, can be used during part of the month in a cyclic fashion or continuously throughout the month. If used in a cyclic fashion for the first 10 days of each month, treatment with a progestin simulates the cyclic exposure to progesterone that would occur if the patient were ovulating. Withdrawal of the progestin after 10 days leads to a regular limited menstrual flow. However, cyclic progestins do not provide contraception. Progestins can also be used in a continuous fashion, daily throughout the month. Progestins can be administered as a shot, a subdermal implant, an intrauterine device, or as oral pills. Continuous progestin does provide contraception and may significantly lighten menstrual flow or lead to its cessation completely, referred to as amenorrhea. Another common treatment for abnormal bleeding is the combination of estrogen plus progestin throughout the month. This regimen can be supplied as a birth control pill, the contraceptive vaginal ring, or the contraceptive patch, which all provide contraception in addition to control of abnormal bleeding. After you start your patient on a medical regimen, it is important to inform her that the effective treatment of anovulatory bleeding takes three to six months for cycle regulation and lightening of menstrual flow. This diagram depicts the change in endometrial thickness over time after initiating hormone treatment for a patient with anovulatory bleeding. Starting on the left side of the slide, you can see the height of the endometrium is well above a normal endometrial height. As treatment continues and menses occur, some of that height is reduced each month with the sloughing of menstrual tissue. After three to four months, a normal endometrial thickness is reached and menses become lighter. This process should be explained to the patient so that she knows to expect heavy menses for about the first three months of treatment. As a PA, you are not expected to manage any patient that is beyond your own or your supervising physician's comfort level. Any bleeding that does not respond to medical management, that is life-threatening, that is associated with abnormalities on ultrasound or endometrial biopsy, or any patient who desires surgical therapy should be referred. Sometimes the bleeding associated with anovulation or other etiologies can be heavy. These patients may be seen in the clinic or in the emergency department. The first consideration is whether the patient is hemodynamically stable. 
You can determine this by visualizing the patient and by checking vital signs. If the patient is hypotensive or tachycardic, the patient may be unstable. Check orthostatic vital signs with a blood pressure and pulse in the supine, sitting, then standing positions. If the patient is orthostatic, this indicates that she is hemodynamically unstable. Patients with heavy bleeding who have a stable and normal blood pressure and pulse can usually be treated on an outpatient basis with oral estrogen or birth control pills. If the patient is not hemodynamically stable, you need to consult a physician and resuscitate the patient with fluids and possibly with packed red blood cells. If uterine bleeding is active, you will also want to initiate therapy to stop the bleeding. This can be done with high-dose intravenous estrogen. This table is a helpful reference for the dosing of medication in patients with varying degrees of abnormal uterine bleeding. Unstable patients, or those who do not rapidly respond to medical therapy, may require surgical treatment, which can include a dilation and curatage, also known as a D and C. Okay, so here's a summary of what we have learned. Know your differential with consideration of the patient's age. Perform a high-quality history and physical exam. Order appropriate laboratory and imaging based on the patient's presentation and always get a pregnancy test. Make sure you have a short-term plan in an emergency and a long-term plan to follow. Most emergency treatments will need to be changed over to a different long-term treatment plan once the patient is stable. Thank you for your attention to this presentation on abnormal uterine bleeding.